Yo, okay, so today we're gonna, I should say tonight, <laughs> it's half three, but tonight we're gonna be looking at um, the second of the Robert Burns poems, um, which is gonna be today, it's gonna be Holy Willie's Prayer. And um, essentially this text, okay, this text uh, is mainly focused Okay, this text is mainly focused on um, the idea or the feeling, the sense of sort of uh, religious hypocrisy um, alongside the sort of idea and the, um, the feeling of... Um, Okay, so so there's an idea basically which is sort of common and many people have this thought which is that oftentimes the very um, people who are in sort of uh, positions of, of leadership in terms of like different religious communities, positions of authority like imams or preachers, priests, pastors, um, these kind of roles and positions of leadership, oftentimes um they they can sort of fall victim to the um they can fall victim to the image that gets built up around them of being sort of like they're just perfect like pious holy people and uh they can project this image while at the same time living a very sort of degen degenerate <clears throat> excuse me degenerate and uh, immoral unethical life in reality because that's a very common, that's a very common common theme, which and it's a very common idea which we all kind of understand. So essentially, this and it extends not just from from people who are in positions of power, but oftentimes this is the same kind of disease or problem which plagues a lot of people who they don't even have to be religious, but they can just be sort of self righteous in any kind of self righteous in general. For example, this could happen to people who are who feel very strongly about different economic uh different economic systems like a person that is uh sort of super super socialist or super super communist or even a person on the opposite end who is super super free market super super um you know in terms of uh capitalist and that can happen people with food you know someone's super vegan or the opposite someone's super meat eater it doesn't really matter okay what the field of um what what the field in question is. The point is, this poem essentially examines the idea of someone who is self-righteous. In other words, they think that they, um, in some respects, are better than other people. They are chosen in some way. And while at the same time revealing the reality of that, which is that they, oftentimes, people who are like this, they are oftentimes worse than the people that they are criticizing, okay? So essentially, central themes in this are hypocrisy, especially like religious hypocrisy, but we can extend it to just be any kind of self-righteous, um, self-righteous sort of uh, thinking or, or behavior. Okay. Okay, so the poem begins. The poem begins, and send the godly in a pit to pray. It's a quote. Okay. O thou that in heaven, this is the actual poem, O thou that in heaven, O you that are in the heavens, uh, meaning above, does dwell, why as it pleases best thy cell, sends one to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read this, um, no, I'll, I'll read some and I'll translate it, I'll do my best to translate it, again, this is written in Scots from the 1700s, so it's not exactly modern Scottish or modern English, but I'll do my best to try and explain it. So basically, What's happening here is you have the the speaker in the poem who is uh, called Holy Willie, Holy William, and uh, the holy in the beginning part is I believe you know a sort of sarcastic way of talking about him. He's called holy in the same way that you would say that someone believes that they are holier than thou in terms of like that's you know, he's a holy person like that, not in a sincere way, but as in like you're making fun of the person that this is the person who believes that they are like super special and spiritual and all that and um that they believe and they act like they're holy okay specially connected to god in some kind of way that's what it means 
So this is this is William. You have William there on his knees, okay, um, and he's praying. So in the beginning of the poem, the main the speaker, who essentially is the main character in the text, the speaker is praying to God, okay, and the 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 poem is essentially capturing what it is that he's saying in his prayer, and uh. And this will tell us about him in terms of how he's thinking and his philosophy and his his perspective. Okay. So his prayer begins. <clears throat> excuse me. His prayer begins by sort of saying that he says, Oh, you that are in the heavens, you it's basically God who is above. What well, please is best to you to send one person to, he to heaven and ten people to hell, all for their all for your glory and not for anyone's good or ill that they've done. Basically, he's saying, he's laying out the idea that he's saying to God that you send people to heaven, you might send one person to heaven, and you might send ten people to hell, and the ten people you sent to hell, they might not have done anything wrong, but you just decided that you want to send them there, and the one person you sent to heaven, he, didn't, he might not have done anything good, but you just decided that you want to send them there, and so it's all in your in your hands, basically. He's laying out a very he's laying out what you could call uh you could call like sort of uh a very strongly destiny type based or um uh maybe strongly strong I don't want to use say Calvinist because I'm not too educated in terms of Calvinism as a whole, but um, let me just say a strongly, strongly destiny-based or deterministic, that would be a better word to put, a deterministic view of spirituality and of the universe in itself. He's basically laying out the idea that there is no sort of good or bad that you can do as an individual, which would take you to heaven or send you to hell, but it's all essentially being chosen for you by God. So there's no point in you doing anything. Or even if you do something, God is the one that puts you in heaven or puts you in hell. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this is a this is a this is a philosophy which still exists to some extent in uh, different religious communities. As I mentioned, I believe Calvinists, or maybe at least some sections of Calvinists, they think this way. I know, for example, there are a number of Muslims who believe this kind of way. Um, especially more so on what you could call the the excuse me the literalist end like the Salafis and those kind of people. Um, in any case, it's like a common sort of philosophy. It's very deterministic. The idea is that you can't. There's nothing that you can do, good or bad, which would take you to hell or heaven. It's already essentially been pre-written for you. It's been destined for you, and you should just accept that this is how things are, and that's it. Huh? So he's already got. I bless, I bless and praise that I might this might with thousands of less in the night, basically saying that God is the most powerful thing there is, or uh, more powerful than anything else. When thousands you have left in night, so, you know, and that I'm here before your sight. So basically there's thousands of people who God has put into the dark. Could be literally with the sun moving away from them, or it could be figuratively in terms of he's cursed them to be, you know, lost and not saved. It's probably both. It's probably both. Um, that here I, before thy sight, for gifts and grace, a burning and shining light to all this place. So here we come to the essential, the essential key in terms of understanding the human in this poem, the speaker himself. You know, it's one thing to talk about the philosophy and the, the ideas of destiny and determin and determinism. Um, if you ask me, obviously, you know, the idea of conceptualizing God in that way and spirituality in that way, it doesn't really make any sense. And even if people, excuse me, even if people say things like this, they don't actually believe it. Because if they actually believed it, they wouldn't do anything. They would just sit down and wait for their destiny to, to happen to them. But they don't do that. They move, they work, they take action, they... They feel pain. They they try to s stop feeling pain. They so pe no one really believes that way. They, they just intellectually believe that way, and they only believe that way for other people. Okay, which is what we're gonna see in this poem essentially, and it's what we see here at the end. Okay, which is the the 
the seed or the opening uh, to hypocrisy, okay, which is going to be laid out in the rest of the poem sort of very clearly, clearly. And essentially this way of thinking, okay, this extremely black and white way of thinking or turning God into like a tyrant or dictator, which is like randomly assorts people to hell and heaven just, you know, randomly without any any real reason. Uh, this type of philosophy is often the philosophy which these types of people take on. Um, and they take this philosophy on, okay, because it gives them the chance and the ability to try to speak on behalf of God. So it's like uh, it's like uh, when different when different um, religious leaders might say, um, you know, God punished this group of people because they did this thing. Huh? What they're really saying is that I hate these people and I'm gonna I'm really glad that they got hurt in some kind of way and I'm gonna now say that God is the one that made this happen to them. Does that make sense? So essentially all of this stems from the individuals taking sort of taking God and then putting themselves as a representation or a spokesperson for God, putting themselves in that position. By extension, making themselves a God on, on earth, huh? which is why they walk about arrogant and talk down to people, etc., etc. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the speaker in this text, he is the same way. That's his, his uh, psychology or that's his sort of uh, mindset in terms of how he's speaking. So he goes on to say, uh, that what was I or my generation that I should get such exaltation basically he's saying to God like <clears throat> excuse me he's humble bragging he's saying you know God why did you choose me why did you choose me to be so great <laughs> he's saying that to God that look you're so great and how come you chose me so essentially by extension he's saying that he believes he is extremely great, so great that God has chosen him directly to be his like uh, spokesperson, like what I'm talking about. It's the sickness of this kind of thinking. The sickness of this kind of thinking, okay, is that uh, people begin to, as I said, excuse me, people begin to believe and think that they can speak on behalf of God. Yeah, that's the, the sickness. Like they'll say things like, <clears throat> they'll say things like God said in the book or God said here God doesn't like this God doesn't like that like this yeah it's like who told you man <laughs> who told you that's what God said yeah one of the biggest keys I can give you I know this is not a philosophy you know, lecture it's not a religious studies lecture but it's extremely important, and I'll, uh, if you don't, if you just remember this, and you don't remember anything else, this is this will be very useful to you. I hope. Um, whenever someone says, "God said this" or "God said that," what they're actually saying is, the text says this, and this is how I interpret it to mean. Does that make sense? So the book says this thing and then here is how i interpret it and that's what i'm saying is what god said or if it's not what they interpreted for themselves here is how my scholar or my priest my pastor or whatever here's how he interpreted it and that's what god said it makes sense so it's not what god said it's what a human said it's what a person said to is just like you just like me what a human being said. So, <clears throat> which is obviously the fundamental reason why this logic leads to very bad outcomes when it's when it's played out in real life and why the people themselves who speak this way, who speak as if they understand or know the infinite, the divine God, which is beyond all understanding, where when they speak this way, they, in reality, their own lives are not reflective of it. Um which is what we're going to see now, why they're extremely hypocritical. Um, or if they do live this way, it leads to extremely bad outcomes for themselves. It's extremely destructive. Um, because essentially what you're doing is you're following a human being and taking them to be your god, yeah, one way or another. You're essentially following another person and 
worshipping them and, and essentially um, taking them as your god, yeah, as your idol, um, or yourself as your own idol. Yeah, if you if you if you believe that this is what God said, definitely, and I'm the one who understands it, like what this guy in the, in the poem, the speaker, is doing. Okay, so he goes on to say, I, what I, <clears throat> excuse me, I what deserved most just damnation for broken laws, <clears throat> excuse me, 6,000 years before my creation through Adam's cause. So basically it's a reference to the Christian idea of original sin. Um, again, I'm not a Christian scholar yet, but it's generally understood that um, at least some Christians believe that uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden in the garden, Adam made a decision. Some Muslims or many Muslims, maybe I would. Say, some Muslims they believe this too. It's common in different different faith traditions. Adam made a mistake in the garden of of Eden, and Adam and Eve they made a mistake, and based on that, uh, human beings were kicked out and they fell to the earth. It's like a common story. <coughs> this was called original sin. It's it's a crime that you are you hold, um, even though you didn't do anything wrong. So, um, so he's saying, even though I'm guilty of this crime, Adam's crime, if you want to call it, they call it the son of the father. Uh, you God still have chosen me to be great, huh? So even though, in uh, six thousand years before my creation, I'm not going to get into uh, all of that stuff. But the point is. He's referencing that, yeah, the original sin idea. When I fell from my mother's womb, you could have plunged me deep into hell. So again, again, um, describing God and turning God into a very sort of tyrannical, uh, you know, unethical, immoral, sort of angry man. And uh, there's a very good quote. It's a very good quote by the ancient philosopher Xenophon, I believe that's his name, Xenophon, who um, he said, he said, uh, there's a quote, I believe it's a Christian quote, which says, uh, God made man in his image. There's a quote from the philosopher, I believe his name is Xenophon, who said, men make God in their image. Men make God in their image. And um, he also, he goes on to say, in Ethiopia, this, he's talking two and a half thousand years ago, Xenophon, he said, in Ethiopia, God or the gods are black. In uh, in Northern Europe, the gods have orange hair and they're white. So what he's saying, basically, Xenophon, back in Very Wise Man, he's saying that oftentimes when people talk about God, what they're doing, okay, is they're not obviously, I mean, who can talk about God and describe God? Uh, who, how do you talk about infinity and describe it? When, they're, when they talk about God and they make him concrete, they, they call it a hymn and all that, they make God concrete and with descriptions and feelings and emotions. What they're doing essentially is they're projecting oftentimes their own image or their own feelings, their own ideas of who they are and what they are, including, especially including all of the bad um, things about them, their anger, their rage, their hatred for other people, their arrogance and desire to destroy their insecurity, <clears throat> excuse me, their tribalism, all of those things, they are they project that onto onto God, and they 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 essentially make God in their image. You understand? And then they then they then they create texts, or then they create commandments, which are essentially just things that they want and things that they desire, um, and they say they attribute these things to God. Huh? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this to you, or we have to do this because God said so. But truthfully, it's just because they want to do it. Uh, they have these negative sides of themselves that come out. Uh, so that's what's happening here, basically. <coughs> excuse me. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So he's turning God into like this kind of monster figure, who's like a di a dictator or tyrannical sort of king. An angry man who just sort of punishes people at random, sends babies to hell, etc. That's what he's laying out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a classic image of hell um, back from back in the day. Okay, so he's saying basically you could have you could have sent me to hell right away because I was guilty even before I was born. Okay, I was guilty even before I was born. Again, obviously not a very smart idea. 
not a very good idea. Uh, but anyway, he's lying now. But then he goes on to say, yeah, yeah, I am here. A chosen sample. You see, yeah, I am here and I'm chosen. I'm special. This is another very common, another very common trait of people who are self-righteous and who are hypocritical in terms of their nature or, you know, their actions and so on. They often believe, you know, if I was to lay out for you, if I was to lay out for you, you know, what is the philosophy of someone who believes these things, who thinks this way? The philosophy often is uh, strong pessimism or nihilism about the future and <clears throat> strong negativity. This would be some kind of philosophy or idea or vision of the world ending in some kind of very dramatic and ugly, ugly way, whether it's in a war between races or a war between different religious groups or a day of destruction where everything is destroyed and remade. This is, this is very common across different ideologies and so on. So a very nihilistic view of the future. The future is, this world is terrible. The future is going to be destructive. Uh, I hate everything. So it's a very depressed and anxious foundation, nihilistic foundation. The future is nothing. This world is nothing. Um, and then coupled with that is the idea of a, a excuse me, a in group and out group, which is like he's saying, he's part of the chosen people. So believing that you are among those people who are saved and chosen and everyone who is not like you and who is not chosen and saved by God. Um, you know, it's a very common idea also among some uh, different religious faiths, traditions that God is the one who saves people and cho chooses who's going to be, you know, part of the group and who's not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you're not part of the group, it means that God didn't choose you. Again, speaking on behalf of God, the, he, God didn't choose you, and so you deserve to be punished, yeah, even though you haven't done anything or whatever. Um, yes, and then um, and then coupled with this is the sort of thing that motivates these kind of people to take action or to speak or to hurt other people, which is the idea that um, not only is there an in-group and an out-group, uh, my, you know, the saved tribe and the not saved tribes, often the majority are seen as the bad or the evil. The minority are seen as the good. Um, is also how you get a cult, by the way, same way. In any case, um, that's not enough. But alongside this, to go with this, is the idea and the motivation that the in-group saved people, God's people, <clears throat> excuse me, the people on the truth, <laughs> the people on the straight path um, um, that these people have either a duty to preach to the big majority and to try to convert them or to fight the big majority and to try to kill them or to separate from the big majority and to try to stay away from them and you can see this well, I just laid out for you this framework. It happens with extreme sort of racial type people, racial supremacists. It happens with people who have strong, different um, philosophical um, stupid ideas. It happens with religious sort of extremism and so on. You understand that? So that's the sort of layout. Um, so he fits, in, he fits in perfectly to this. So he goes on to say, yeah, I am here, a chosen sample. He's part of the in-group one of God's chosen and you notice he is ascribing this to himself it's not as if he received some kind of <clears throat> it's not as if he received some kind of special angel or something <laughs> he's just decided this because he feels this way okay um, that's sh to show to show your grace is great and ample basically that he's so special he represents God's mercy <laughs> And love that's how great he is i'm here a pillar of your temple look how much importance he puts on himself uh, arrogance look at this arrogance uh, strong as a rock a guide a guide so he's got all the answers and the knowledge that to give away he doesn't need to learn anything new a ruler he has authority and uh, the right to rule he's like a king and an example to thy flock he's perfect he doesn't make any mistakes 
you see <clears throat> um c completely the you know it's very interesting as well the way he thinks the way he thinks is completely opposite to the way that actual good people think right actually ethical people moral people the way that they think is not like this an actually ethical moral person is someone who is actively working on trying to be good trying to do good things and that preoccupies them so much that they don't have time to be reaching and talking about how good they are or judging other people etc because they recognize all their own flaws and and <clears throat> They recognize all their own flaws and they are actively working to get rid of them or to help people, you know, to give other people a hand up to end suffering in some way, to help relieve pain in some way. Um, and the last thing they're going to do is preach about how great they are. And oftentimes people who are actually good and ethical and moral, they don't want to be seen as role models and leaders and to have authority. They don't, they don't want those things because... They recognize that they're just human and they're imperfect and they're a work in progress. You understand? It's like the complete opposite of the one who's like, yeah, follow me. I'm God's chosen. Yeah, it's like, yes. <clears throat> okay. Oh, Lord, you can. So, oh, Lord, you know what zeal I bear. Now he's saying to God. And it's like such a level of arrogance. You're saying to God, I know what you know. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. I know the mind of infinity. <clears throat> Excuse me, saying, God, you know what zeal I bear, you know how much passion and spirituality I have. When drinkers drink and swear, swear and singers there and dancers here with great and small, for I am keep it. I am keep it by the fear, free free them. I stay away from them. So basically, when people are partying and having a good time, drinking and singing and dancing, I stay away from them. So you can see he's taken the, he's taken the, remember I said there's three different, um, options that people who are like this take separation fighting or preaching he's taken in this in that little scene there in that verse he's taken the separation thing he's the guy who stands by himself judging everyone and if you try to talk to him he just gets angry gets angry and he, he, he gets aggressive and if you question his ideas he shuts down or and if he can't argue you know why his ideas make sense he just calls you a sinner, or calls you, you know, uh, mean names, and then he and then he backs off into his little cave. Yes. Okay. So then, uh, then the poem now goes on to now establish sort of his hypocrisy more clearly. <sighs> Okay, so remember, this is the man who's just went and for two verses, he spent essentially laying out how good he is, how holy he is, how spiritually amazing he is, how he's like an angel, essentially. God has specifically chosen him to be his, you know, representative on earth and that he has authority to be preaching, etc. He goes, but yet, but yet, O Lord, confess I must. At times I'm fashed with fleshly lust and sometimes too inwardly trust our self gets in but you remember we are dust defiled with sin <laughs> so basically he's about to say he's saying listen at times god um <laughs> at times i'm weak and at times i have a strong desire to sin to do the wrong thing especially in terms of women okay, i have a strong desire for women and to be physical with them and then you see, like, the way he sets up. <laughs> he sets up in a way of already giving himself an excuse and a way out. But you remember we're dust defiled with sin. So he's saying, like, it's not even my fault yet that I'm like this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's again, sort of laying out the, another very common thing, which is many of these people, especially people who have power positions um, in different religious communities, or people are extremely... Um, self-righteous yes extremely self-righteous many of these people okay will hold a simultaneous victim and conqueror or king uh identity at the same time even though it's contradictory and doesn't make sense they hold it at the same time in other words they are a king in terms of being chosen they're part of god's 
chosen people or they're on the right path or they're following those people who are on the right path uh, directly and or if it's if it's more in the secular realm, they have all the truth, or they're the truth. They're correct. Huh. Excuse me. They're gonna be the ones that save the earth, or they're the heroes for the climate, or they're the heroes for whatever animal rights, whatever. Um. So they are they're heroic in some way. They're like kings, huh? Like he said, I have authority. I'm a ruler. They're like kings in one way or queens in one way. But at the same time, they hold the victim identity at the same time, which is, for example, with the religious type people, we are the chosen, we're great, but the whole world's against us. What can we do yet? The whole world's against us. Or all these non-believers are against us. They're plotting against us. Eh? Or America's against us. Or whatever. Or uh, climate change, you know. The, the big companies, the countries and everything, they're all against us. You know, even though we're in the right, but you know, what can we do yet? So if we do something wrong, it's really not our fault because obviously how can we how can we win this battle? Understand? It's like victim plus conqueror or, or hero at the same time, which doesn't make sense. But it's a way of accommodating their hypocrisy or accommodating the wrongs they do um, while still allowing them to feel like they are um, heroes or kings or still chosen in some way. Okay, so then he goes on to admit some of the bad things that he's done. Okay, he says, Oh Lord, yesterday, you know, or yesterday, and I'm not sure if this is yesterday or, or, you know, before that, but anyway, it's in the past. You know, again, claiming knowledge of what God knows, extremely arrogant. With Meg, it's a girl, thy pardon, I sincerely beg, please forgive me. Oh, may it never be a living plague to my dishonor. Please don't let this affect my... Uh, you know, myself, don't let it affect my character or whatever, reputation. And I will never lift a lawless leg <laughs> upon her again. So basically, he was with some girl called Meg. Man couldn't help himself. He's with some pretty girl called Meg. And uh, yeah, they got busy. Yeah, basically, that's the idea. So this, uh, this perfect chosen man of God, yeah, basically, he was with some chick and... Uh, they got busy, yeah, basically. And bear in mind, this is the guy. You now you think, what's the big deal? Of course, not a big deal. But um, this is the guy who, at the beginning of the poem, yeah, he was the one saying, I stay away from people who are doing what? Singing, dancing, and uh, drinking. Okay. Which, if you were going to make a list of, like, um, unethical behavior, singing and dancing, they're like, uh, what's, there's no harm in that, right? Doing this behind the scenes, no one's watching. Uh, sleeping with a girl behind the scenes, they're not married. And this is the 1700s, remember? So the chances of getting pregnant or disease and all that stuff, very common. Um, that's way on the other side, right? So he's not even just doing the simple things, but he's doing like the, you know, the way worse, if you were going to put a scale, the way worse things, according to his own culture and his own beliefs. Uh, they're, it's way worse to do that than to sing and dance and, and drink, which would be in his own mind less so I'm not I'm not saying what one's better or one's worse. I'm saying in his own in his own thinking that one would be ways worse. <clears throat> Excuse me, considered a mortal sin or something extremely bad as compared to singing, dancing and drinking, which would just be considered like, you know, a night out or something. You understand? In his own mind. So he's breaking his own ethics. Why? Because he doesn't really have ethics. That's the point. That's the point. Huh? That's the point when people are self-righteous. They don't really have ethics or strong values, which is why they talk so much about what they are or what they, you know, they. it's why they self-aggrandize so much. Huh? They tell other people so much. They project their lack of ethics and value. Uh, onto other people. That's why they're always at war, because right? they, they don't feel any peace inside themselves. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> so it gets better. So he did that with one girl. <clears throat> he did that with one girl. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he goes on to say, besides I, father, I further 
must or mon about and further further must explain or or talk about. We we Lizzie's last three times. <laughs> Man was getting busy yeah, three times. That's two different girls. Huh? It's two different girls he's talking about. We Lizzie's girl. So Lizzie must be some I don't know some guy. So it's another girl three times, and he says, "I throw or I throw." I don't know how to pronounce the word, but it means I believe or I think. It means he's not sure how many times he's done this. <laughs> how many times he's done this? He's not sure yet. That's <laughs> so again, you can see, <clears throat> you can see the man has no real values or principles. Nothing really that he stands on. Just, uh, just a lot of sort of self righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he goes on to say, okay. So he goes on, and another thing is all, which is quite interesting about this, you know, poem and, and what we've talked about so far. Remember, this man was saying, this man was saying that God, that God is the one who is, you know, super mighty and so on, and God puts people in heaven, God puts people in hell. So what he's effectively saying is that God has chosen an adulterer, if you want to use the word, a fornicator, <laughs> a man who sleeps around unmarried, which in his, in his mind, in this speaker's mind, is an extreme sin in the speaker's mind. God, and he's attributing this to God. He's attributing this to the divine, saying that the, God has made him, this adulterer, fornicator, person who is committing an extreme sin, again, in his own mind, as one of the chosen people. <laughs> but other people who are singing and dancing, they're the criminals. <laughs> to the criminals. You understand the stupidity of it? This is the problem with extreme thinking in any way. Extreme religious thinking or ideological thinking, dogmatic thinking. This is the problem with it. You end up with stupidity essentially you end up with things which don't make sense make sense okay so then he goes on to say i'll try and speed up a little bit then he goes on to say but lord that friday i was found means i was drunk when i came near her so again he makes excuses it's not his fault before because he was dust it's adam's fault <laughs> or it's god's fault because he made us as dust so it's really his god's fault and it's not even my fault and now here he was drunk so remember he said he didn't drink with other people? Here he's drunk. So <laughs> again, hypocrisy. When I came near her, so it's like, it's not my fault. Yeah, I was drunk three times, I think. And three times it happened. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, it's not my fault. Or else you know that your servant is true and would never steal her. So basically, look, most of the time I'm good. But three times I think, you know, I messed up. And then the Meg... The neighbor, whatever. Listen, let's not talk about her yet. You know, I made the dust. It's not my fault yet. Come on. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Stupidity, stupidity. Okay. Anyway, it goes on. You know, and and it's it's crazy because like I'm laughing about this and we're joking about it, but there's many people who actually think this way. It's extremely unfortunate. It's extremely unfortunate. It's many people who believe this way, think this way. Um. And it's not good yet. It's very self-destructive and it's very destructive in terms of how they impact other people. So um, I would strongly recommend you do not think this way. But instead, you should you should try and go for actual ethics, actual virtue, actual understanding of how to be a good person and, and you know, via action, not through talking and all that. Excuse me, but through action. Being a good person. Okay. Anyway. But maybe maybe you let this fleshy thorn buffet thy servant even and mourn. Lest the overproud and high should turn. So again, look, he's saying again he's blaming God for his for his own mistakes. Again, the victim thing, you see, but maybe he's saying he's saying, This thing that happened to me, this fleshy thorn, buffet thy servant even and mourn, lest the overproud and high should turn. That's He's so gifted if they say he that your hand won't even be born until you left it. Okay, so basically he's saying, look, 
maybe you put this either he's talking about his lust his desires maybe you put them inside me because otherwise i would just be perfect 100 percent. so you put this inside me to test me it's another common phrase in different religious circles you put this in to just keep me humble and to make sure that i know that i'm great i'm chosen but i'm not like you know i'm not perfect i still do some things wrong and so again you can see or he's talking about the things that he's done the great sins in his eyes and saying again it's god's fault you understand no accountability no responsibility for his own actions <clears throat> excuse me okay so if all of that wasn't bad enough if all of that wasn't bad enough what he's going to do now Okay, what he's going to do now is he's now going to start turning his attention from the inward, even though he's not really looked inward, to be honest with you. He's just, all of this at this point was just a sort of bargaining with God or blaming God for his mistakes or actions. I should say choices. Blaming God for his own choices and exclaiming how perfect and chosen he is. Okay, so that's what all that was, right? Now, what he's going to do, okay, he's, he's going to move on from that and... He's now going to turn his attention outward towards his enemies, people he dislikes for whatever reason. And he's now, he's now going to ask God to, to curse them in some way, to punish them in some way. He's now going to try and turn God into his own uh, like attack dog, something like that, yeah, which is, again, a very common theme or idea among different religious groups and people. It's like what they what they do, yeah, God, please punish these people or curse these people like that, like as if God is... <laughs> <laughs> like some kind of security guard or something, <laughs> assassin or something that just attacks on their on their <laughs> commands. Uh, it's wild. Okay. Anyway, so he goes on to say, Lord, bless this, bless thy chosen. He's talking about himself. He's saying, Bless me, I'm the chosen one in this place. For here you have cho for here you for here thou has a chosen race, meaning I'm part of the chosen people. But God confound their stubborn face and blast their name and bring thy rulers to disgrace and what, sorry, what bring thy rulers to disgrace and open shame. So what he's saying is the people who bring your rulers, meaning he's talking about himself, he's including himself among these. Remember, he believes that he is an authority figure chosen by God directly. He's saying anyone who disagrees with me, destroy them. That's what he's saying. Anyone who disagrees with what I think, destroy them. So again, you can see all of this is just the sort of, it's just the monkey mind, you know, of man. Or the immature, even if you don't want to say monkey, it's the immature, childish mind. You know, one thing I often think is that um, I've got this idea. I've got this idea. I need to write a book or an essay on it, which is that people, <clears throat> excuse me, people get stuck at different developmental ages. And um, this can happen uh, as a constant. In other words, they just live at this developmental age. Like some people, they get stuck at 15. <laughs> they don't move on past. They could be 40 years old and acting and living and talking and thinking like they're 15, feeling emotions like they were 15. Um, or it can happen when people get triggered. Okay, and they can get triggered into a developmental age and they can express those emotions and those actions, thoughts, words that they would express at that developmental age. So, for example, like someone could get triggered into acting like they were two, <laughs> like a man who's 30 or something can become triggered to acting like a teenager or to acting like he's a child, like a five year old, you know via his anger for example where now he's going to be like a f and you can see it you can see with their reaction they get triggered and then they just want to destroy everything like a five-year-old or like a 10-year-old and he was angry he was having a fit <laughs> he was moody about something <laughs> or they can get <clears throat> you know you understand what i'm saying they can get they can get stuck at these ages you know i believe that there's some people that but they're stuck at certain developmental ages because they haven't worked past whatever it is that they need to work past. And so they just keep on expressing that developmental age. And so all this is what he's saying here, you know, destroy these people, etc. It's like a kid that he's basically, it's like a kid talking to his big brother or talking to his dad. You know, dad, those people are mean to me. <laughs> Go beat them up. 
It's like that, yeah. And again, it's complete, complete absolution or complete uh, letting go of personal responsibility and personal um, accountability. And truthfully, it's a complete lack of personal courage, really. Because in reality, <clears throat> I would say the more ethical a person becomes, the more courageous and so on the person becomes, the less they are hateful towards other people and the less that they think this way. Why? Because they, they do not expect other people to fight their battles for them. The hero dislikes war. The soldier dislikes. They do not like. They hate war. They hate conflict. Why? Because when conflict starts, the hero is the one who has to fight the damn conflict. <laughs> That's why they don't want conflict. They don't want war. You understand? There's only people who have no courage and who have no intention of fighting the battle. Who love to, <laughs> who love to stoke the battle up, like this guy. Uh, he wants God to send a tornado or something against these people, because he himself has no courage, no backbone, no spine, no willingness for self-sacrifice to do the right thing, to protect someone. Because that's because if you look where he's saying all this, he's not saying it to the person he dislikes. He's not talking to them. He is saying this in his bedroom somewhere, uh, in a dark room or something like that. And also, don't get confused between courage and aggression. They're not the same thing. Like an extremely an extreme religious person or an extremist in I say, any ideology, they can be very loud be very aggressive, be very bullying to someone who who can't do anything in response to that bullying or aggression. If they have a gun in their hand, they can be very aggressive and loud. But that's not courage. Huh? That is not courage. That's bullying, yeah, aggression. It's weak. It's cowardly. It's, coward. it's the opposite of courage. Courage is, <clears throat> excuse me, courage is, here is a danger. This danger could kill me. I'm going to go ahead and step forward anyway because there's people here who need to be protected. That's courage. Or there's something true and right which needs to be defended. That's courage. Understand? It's it's willingness to engage with fear, knowing that you could die, knowing that you could not win. But you do it anyway because... It's the right thing to do. It makes sense. Without any any desire for personal reward or gain or, you know, like that. That's courage. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Anyway. Anyway, so he goes on to say. He goes on to say. Okay. What well, bring their rulers to disgrace and open shame. Lord mind gone Hamilton says one of his enemies deserts. Meaning give him what he deserves. He drinks and swears and plays cards. Again, you can see petty things he's bringing up as big crimes. Yeah, he has so many taking arts, maybe talking arts. He's a good speaker with great and small, meaning with great people and small people from God's own priest, the people's hearts he steals away. So I I tried to you know do some research on this and understand what it's talking about. I believe there was some kind of trial or something that happened. Anyway, it's not a big deal. The point is that he's... He dislikes this person. He doesn't like this person he's talking about. And he sees that this person is very popular. People like him. People listen to him. And he you could assume you could assume he's very jealous of this person. And so he wants God to destroy the person. Essentially, that's the sum up. Okay. And you can see the things that he points out as crimes. He drinks, he plays cards and things. These are way less than his own sort of crimes in terms of his own thinking. Bear in mind. When I say crimes, I mean from his own perspective. That's how you need to judge someone based on their own ethics when it comes to things like this. Huh? So even by his own standards, he's he's failing. That makes sense. Even by his own standards, he's failing in an extreme way. Worse than the people that he's criticizing. But he doesn't acknowledge that he is failing. He just basically puts off his own failings as, a, as a, not his own fault. It's not even as mistakes, but as a, things which are not in, not his fault. They're God's fault, essentially. That's what he does. Okay. 
goes on to say, and when we, and when we chastened him, therefore, basically, he says, we, you know, and notice he says, we, not I. Again, cowardly, he's not, he's not brave, he's cowardly. <laughs> it's like, people say like in different rap songs, people say, uh, you're brave with the gang, but when you're on your own, it's different. I was like, <laughs> So this gang of people who also believe they're chosen he was brave but anyway so when we chastened him meaning when we when we when we criticized him shouted at him like doing this kind of thing you seen how we uh bred sick explore and set the world in a roar of laughing at us so again um um the person who he was trying to go against criticize he was obviously intelligent and he was able to Make the make this guy uh, look silly. I make the speaker look silly, and other people were laughing at them. Curse you, is basket and a store Cali and kale. Sorry, kale and potatoes. So again, I think this is something to do with the trial at the time, which is something to do with that the the man grew up, grew some food or something, grew some potatoes, something. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. The point is, it's just an extension of showing the speakers hyper focus on things which are tiny and don't really matter and are not actually crimes or not actually unethical hyper focusing on them and saying to god look punish this guy whereas he has his own huge mistakes his own huge crimes in his own eyes his own huge unethical behaviors which he's saying god don't look at these yet and plus when you look at these it's not my fault but it's your fault so he ascribes extreme innocence to himself while ascribing extreme guilt to other people that makes sense okay <clears throat> lord hear my earnest cry and prayer my sincere words and prayer against that press be try of error uh, against another person or another group that he doesn't like thy strong right hand lord make it bear upon their heads so he wants god to smash these people on their heads Lord, visit them and don't spare them. Uh, don't forgive them. So don't, please don't do for them what I'm asking you to do for myself. But destroy them all. Destroy them all. The people I don't like, destroy them. Okay, oh Lord my God, that glib-tongued Aiken, meaning the person who's very good at speaking, this is another person who's, he doesn't like. My very heart and flesh are quaking to think how I sat sweating and shaking and pished with dread. It's a nice little metaphor. With fear. While old, with hanging lip, gade sneaking, and hit his head. So again, the point is, he's saying this was another person who he had an interaction with, and the person made him feel afraid in some kind of way, or angry in some kind of way. This here means drunk with fear, and uh, sweating and shaking and all that. So it's either anger or it's fear. In either case, it's both of these are emotions of the weak, of the prey. Predators don't feel anger and they don't feel fear. <clears throat> I should say a better word than predators is um, ethical or heroic people. Generally speaking, they don't really feel much anger and they don't feel fear, generally speaking. Especially in situations where things happen, where there's a confrontation. The truly heroic person, they don't feel fear in that moment. Why not? Because they feel something more than that. They feel duty. That makes sense. The soldier doesn't feel fear in the moment where the action is happening. The monster appears. The hero doesn't feel fear. He feels duty. He doesn't think fear. He thinks, I need to do something. Afterwards, maybe he feels fear. Uh, you know, He's thinking about it back. He feels fear. He may feel anger. He has to work through it. But in the moment, he doesn't feel fear because he feels courage. You understand? He feels courage and duty, responsibility. Anyway, it's, the point is, it's just another sign that this is a weak individual who's not um, ethically strong. Excuse me. Okay. Anyway, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, Lord, in thy day of vengeance, try him. So again, not just... Um, don't just destroy them here in this world, but in the next, on the Day of Judgment, destroy them again. So really he hates these people so much and he wants God to do the worst of the worst of the worst to them. As if God was his own little 
like I said, as if God is, is his personal sort of security guard or, or assassin or something like that. Okay, just minimizing God and making God like look very bad at, or describing God in a very disrespectful kind of way. Okay, Lord visit him, that did employ him. So not just the person who he hates, but his employer too, <laughs> his boss of the guy he hates, destroy him too. And pass not in thy mercy by them, nor hear thy prayer. Look at that. He's saying, destroy them. Don't listen to their prayers. Don't forgive them. This extreme, extreme, extreme anger and rage. Huh? But for thy people's sake, destroy them and don't spare. So again, just to sort of, I guess this would be number four on my list in terms of the... Um, the framework that I laid out of a self-righteous person. Number four would be the belief that the things they believe and the things they think and do are done for the benefit of humanity as a whole. So it's not enough for them to think and to believe that they are doing these things or acting this way because it's good for them as an individual. But they have the extreme arrogance, okay, the extreme self-aggrandizement, that they are the ones who are the saviors of humanity, that the things they do are so great that everyone in the world <laughs> should say thank you to them. So that's what he's saying, eh? for thy people's sake, destroy them. God, I know that this is the right thing that you should do. And if you do it, it's going to be good for everyone. What he really means is, when he says, thy people, it's even worse. It's going to be good for your chosen people. And your chosen people are good for everyone. Okay? <clears throat> so, he then goes on to say, okay, I'll read this first and I'll, I'll, I'll read this. But Lord, remember me and mine. So he goes from extreme anger now to, again, now making his bargains with uh, God. Remember me and mine. So everything I said about those people, don't apply that to me yet. For me, make a special case. With mercies temporal and divine. With mercies temporal and divine. Temporal meaning something to do with time. Let's say, give me mercy, love, and all that good things all the time, infinitely. And divine, make them great. That I for grace and gear me. That gear might be a, a mis mistake in words. I'm not sure. That I for grace and gear me shine. Excelled by none. So make me the greatest. <laughs> Make me the greatest of everyone, huh? excelled by none, and all the glory shall be thine. <laughs> <clears throat> what a humble guy. Yeah. So he says, look, make me the greatest, and then, because I'm the greatest, but don't worry, I'm going to tell everyone that you are the one who gave this to me. <laughs> like some kind of partnership. Huh? Amen, amen. Uh, yeah, he throws in a second amen just to make sure. Okay, so essentially, uh, what I have here, this is a, a nice verse from the from the Bible itself. Okay, which is, uh, I forgot what the name of this what this parable or the story is, but essentially, the verse from the Bible, I, I thought it was quite appropriate to this. Um, I'm not a Christian, but I thought this was quite appropriate to the to the poem. This is not in the poem. I should mention this is something that I added. I thought it was quite appropriate. Um, it says, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, while he who humbles himself shall be exalted. So there's a story okay, that there was two people, uh, I forget the exact story, but there's two people. And essentially, there was a question about something like, I don't know, which one is better or something like that, yeah, along those lines. And uh, one person, he began to brag about how many good things he'd done and all of that, while the other person... You can see in the background, he was essentially, he was living in a humble way. And obviously the idea is that the one behind, who looks like he's just like, you know, a poor kind of guy who's not, you know, he's, he's quiet and all that, that he is the great one. And the one who's bragging about how great he is and how much amazing things he's done, he is the one who is not great. And eh? he's the one that is uh, shouldn't be looked at as good. He should be looked at, he should be looked down on, basically. That's the idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's that's the rough idea. So anyway, it's appropriate to this because obviously, um, holy Willie, 
Yes, William. He he represents, um, obviously the second the second guy, the one who's talking about all the goodies, how great he is, and how how divine he is, how moral and ethical he is. When in reality, he's none of those things. He's just talking about them. Okay. Now, in terms of the main themes in this text, obviously we have hypocrisy, which I laid out throughout you know this explanation, this lecture. The idea, obviously, being presenting yourself as being perfect, as being ethical to the point of being able to tell other people what God wants and all that, being able to tell that, being able to say that you know what God's thinking and stuff, while living essentially a degenerate type of life, an unethical life, and a hateful life, an extremely hateful type of life of uh, wanting other people to be destroyed, punished, and... um punished forever and never forgiven and all that, being very extremely hateful, whilst putting on the face that you are a godly person. Hypocrisy. Okay, now number two would be dangers of the pious or the self-righteous. I kind of laid that out too, which is that this way of thinking is extremely destructive to other people and to yourself. Um, as we've seen in the side, you can see how, how hateful he is, how negative. Imagine being him for a day. <laughs> you wouldn't want to. You can imagine how, how negative his relationships are and everything else. And if this philosophy turned outward and that hatred wasn't just verbal, but it became actualized through action, it would essentially manifest in violence. In violence. Okay. Number three, judgment of others. So believing that you are part of the chosen people, the in-group, and other people are evil, so evil that the God should destroy them, not listen to their prayers, and all of that. Judgment of others as being lesser than lesser than himself, um, as being below himself, as him being a ruler over them, they should obey him, and all of that. Speaking on behalf of God, like I laid out, so all these things which I just said, believing that he is chosen, he's perfect, he can tell other people what they should do, how they should live, and all of that. Uh, while he himself is uh, sort of free of that judgment. Anything he does is a mistake. Anything anyone else does is a, is a serious crime. Even though the things that other people do in his own moral system are lesser in terms of, you know, criminality than his own mistakes, or his own choices, I should say. Uh, but still viewing their, theirs as worse and his as better. Okay. <clears throat> now, the final thing I'll say on this is um, the connection Okay, that the connection that this poem has um to sort of bigger bigger things is um that this poem <clears throat> excuse me, this poem is essentially in many ways this poem is a reflection of what you could call enlightenment thinking. And uh, the enlightenment was essentially um a period in time which is running while this poem was written, it's from I believe the late sixteen hundreds to the sometime in the eighteen hundreds. I forget exactly the specifics, but anyway, it was around when this poem was written. And Robert Burns is obviously one of the main Enlightenment figures. So anyway, the Enlightenment was the period of time when people began to realize that many of the people who are in power, you know, church leaders or you know, faith leaders mosque leaders, synagogue leaders, whatever you want to say, faith leaders, people who are in positions of power, who have had positions of power in terms of saying God wants this, God says do this, and so on and so on, that many of these people, excuse me, were, were not rightly in power, and many of the time, much of the time, they were just sort of taking advantage of that power. It was the time people began to self-educate, and they began to think about things, not so much in terms of you know, traditional religious thinking, or I shouldn't even say that, literal, relig or no, I shouldn't even say that, dogmatic, self-righteous religious thinking, that's a better way of saying it. Um, the thinking along the lines of Holy William, as we laid out in this, um, the idea that kings were chosen by God, those type of sort of self-serving beliefs and ideas, um, this this priest is chosen by God, the Pope's chosen by God and all that stuff, huh? that this religious group of, you know, Muslims or whatever, Jews or whatever, whatever, that these people are chosen by God specifically and they're perfect and all that. Huh? These are the certain beliefs that you need to have, whatever, whatever. 
they began to let go of these ways of thinking and instead began to focus more on reason and logic and humanism and thinking things um thinking things through only aiming at the truth not aiming at sort of tradition or not aiming at like um what had been said before or what people you know expressed and and believed due to fear or whatever, whatever. essentially becoming <clears throat> excuse me, empowered and ethical in a real way, in a philosophical kind of way. So this poem is an expression of that. Hmm. Uh, satirizing and making fun of the sort of other way of th thinking and the other sort of hypocritical way of thinking and negative way of thinking. That makes sense. That's what this poem is, part of the Enlightenment sort of tradition. And... Um, Overall, I think I think the poem is, you know, it's it's definitely, um, it's definitely a very good, a very good, sort of poetic analysis of when uh, when uh, sort of self-serving ideology how how it looks and how it manifests itself, and um, I, I think this this lecture was a bit longer because I think you know it touches on some important themes, and um, I think it's very important that you know um that we think about these themes and we try we try our best to try and you know actually be ethical and good and moral and not just wear the mask of morality while not living an actually an actually moral and good and helpful useful productive life anyway take care